And if you will, take your Bible with me tonight and turn to John chapter 11. John chapter 11 is not an unfamiliar passage to those of you that are here. It's a great, and it's a great account in the ministry of the Lord Jesus. Uh, I think it's a turning point in his earthly ministry. Uh, even though it's such a positive thing that happens, it turns out to be very negative for the Lord because the Sanhedrin makes up their mind that <laughs> they can't have this going on and they determine they must kill Jesus as a result of what happens in John chapter 11. And so I want to read, not the whole chapter, but just some verses. You got it? Uh, John chapter 11, let me begin and just read uh, the first six verses to begin with. Now a certain man was sick named Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary and her sister Martha. It was Mary which anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair. By the way, that's in the next chapter, chapter 12. Whose brother Lazarus was sick. Therefore, his sister sent unto him, saying, Lord, behold, him whom thou lovest is sick. When Jesus heard that, he said, This sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God might be glorified thereby. Now Jesus loved Mary, or loved Martha, and her sister, and Lazarus. When he heard, therefore, that he was sick, he abode two days still in the same place where he was. Hmm. That's odd. He didn't move. Drop down with me, if you will, to verse 39. He gets there, finally. And, of course, it's too late. Lazarus is dead. Jesus said, Take ye away the stone. Martha, the sister of him that was dead, said unto him, Lord, by this time he stinketh, for he hath been dead four days. In other words, his body in the hot Israel heat had begun decomposition. Jesus said, Said I not unto thee that thou wouldest, if thou wouldest believe, thou shouldest see the glory of God? And then they took the stone away from the place where the dead laid. Jesus prays then. And then when he's done praying, verse 43, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And he that was dead came forth, bound hand and foot with grave clothes, and his face was bound about with a napkin. And Jesus said unto them, Loose him and let him go. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you tonight for this wonderful account in the earthly ministry of our Lord Jesus, the Messiah. This is one of the authenticating, confirming evidences of who he is. That is, the God of heaven revealed in human flesh. We pray tonight that uh, we would hear from him and that we would see him in a spiritual way that would uh, impact our lives, teach us, instruct us tonight, give us listening ears. Lord, as I cast the net again, I pray that you would see to it that I would catch men. And I will thank you for that as I pray in, in the name of, that is for the glory of Jesus. Amen. All of us, love to be able to purchase something that uh, we really wanted or perhaps really needed and then realized afterwards that it's even better than what we thought. We need to be careful not to spiritually shortchange ourselves by thinking that God has to do a particular thing at a specific time in a certain way and according to particular circumstances. These two sisters, Martha and Mary, they not only got their brother back, but they saw God's glory on display before their very eyes. God wants to do much more than we think. He is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we may ask or even think. 
I'm reminded of the prophet Elijah on Mount Carmel when he had uh, thoroughly saturated the altar and the sacrifice and, and he prayed for God to send that fire from heaven to consume the sacrifice. He got much more than what he prayed for. I think perhaps Elijah's act of faith in setting all of this up may have brought him to the very edge of his faith, but God's response revealed that God wasn't limited at all. And uh, God revealed to him that he had much more than he even asked for. Here we see at least, I think, two important truths related to the ways of God. And I want to share these things because they've, they've been important and encouraging to me. And uh, specifically in line with when we want, when we pray and ask God to do certain things and perhaps when it's all said and done, it doesn't really, it doesn't reach the level of accomplishment that perhaps we had envisioned. And we can tend to be discouraged and disappointed in our flesh. And so I want to share these things with you. And the first thing is what we find there in the seventh or the sixth verse of chapter 11. And I call that a, a surprising delay. It's on God's part. A surprising delay. And it's so surprising because he delays at such an unexpected time. I mean, if you had the ability to help someone that was at, that, that was at death's door, wouldn't you immediately move to do so? I mean, that seems natural. They expected Jesus in his timing to show up before the death of their brother not after he had died. And because of this surprising delay and the unexpected time here, it, uh, it resulted in a misunderstanding about the Lord. Uh, in verse 21 and verse 31, both sisters come at two different times to meet Jesus in the way before he actually gets there uh, to the tomb, to the grave, and they say the exact same thing. They say, if only, if only you had come earlier, if only you had been here before our brother died, he wouldn't have died. And yet Jesus deliberately delayed at an unexpected time like this. God's power is not stopped, nor even is it diminished by God's delays. And that's something that we need to learn, and that's something that we need to never forget. And I've said it a thousand times, but I remind myself when I tell you or tell others, and that is, God is never in a hurry. What is a surprising delay to mankind is not to God. He is never in a hurry. And his delays in no way ruin his ability to rescue. But this surprising delay also encompasses not only an unexpected time, here he comes after the death and before, uh, instead of before it, but under unexpected circumstances. They expected Jesus to arrive at the sickbed, not at the tomb, and uh, that results in misjudging him. In the 37th verse, the uh, Jewish mourners uh, that uh, were part of that, uh, that uh, crowd say in verse 37, some of them said, could not this man which Open the eyes of the blind. He did that in chapter 9. Have caused that even this man should not have died? They misjudged him. This surprising delay 
at an unexpected time under unexpected circumstances brought not only a misunderstanding about Jesus, but a misjudgment of him. Perhaps you're guilty of misjudging the Lord because you think that he didn't come through for you or perhaps a loved one of yours. But God even gives hope at a funeral, and that's what we have here. And there is nothing too hard for the Lord, and there is nothing impossible to him. And God is infinitely greater from your big, uh, 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 of your biggest problem. Don't forget that. So a surprising delay, as we see in verse 6. But then, couple that with what I would call a surprising response. God's surprising delay met by God's surprising response. And it's in a very unexpected way. They expected that Jesus would do things their way. God always does things his way. You know why? Because your way and my way is not wise. Because God's way, which he always does things his way, is best. It's always the best way. We find that often after the fact, but God's way is always the best way, and that's why he always does things his way. And uh, we must never forget that his ways and our ways are worlds apart. Remember how Isaiah says it in chapter 55, 8 and 9? Uh, Your ways are not God's ways. And he says, God's ways are higher than our ways. Yeah, they are. God's ways are as high as heaven above our ways. They're worlds apart. And so God's response is in a very unexpected way. Isaiah 64 and verse 4, of course, Paul quotes this in 1 Corinthians 2, but here's where he gets it. From Isaiah 64, 4, the prophet says, For since the beginning of the world, men have not heard, nor perceived by the ear, nor hath the eye seen, O God, beside thee, what he hath prepared for him that waiteth for him. We have no idea what God has prepared for them that wait for him. The unexpected ways of God have to be waited for. The unexpected, Spurgeon says, is always happening. God intervenes in a way in which we never thought of. And even if we've been listening for his footsteps, we've not heard the sound of it. Even if we've been watching for his coming, we've not seen his approach. Only God knows all that he will do. Isn't that a great thought? His surprising response. It's in an unexpected way. It always is. And I'm glad for that in one sense. It sets me back. It humbles me. And it makes me realize that I'll never be able to figure this person out. He is so high above me. But this surprising response is not only in an unexpected way, but it brings about unexpected results. And that's probably the clearest message here. They expected a miraculous restoration But Jesus desired them to experience a miraculous resurrection. Big difference. Not just a healing, but a raising from the dead is what Jesus planned. You know, we often shortchange ourselves and we bring unnecessary problems and pains to our lives because we are impatient. We are unwilling to wait on God's time and God's way of fulfilling his his will in our life. We're going to see a prime example of that this Sunday morning when we look at chapter 16 in the book of Genesis and we see how Ishmael came to be. You know the story. 
But think of the pain and the problem that has come not only to the household of Abraham and Sarah, but to the whole world as a result of a man and a woman that uh, had the promise of God, but they were unwilling to wait on God's time and God's way to see his word, his promise fulfilled to them. Someone said the ability to calm your soul and wait before God is one of the most difficult things in the Christian life. Our flesh is restless. The world around us is frantically in a hurry. But a restless heart usually leads to a reckless life. Let me repeat that quote. A restless heart usually leads to a reckless life. We mess up big time when we are unwilling, when we become impatient and do not wait on God's time and God's way. The songwriter says, God works in mysterious ways His wonders to perform. They are mysterious to us. As I said, we'll never be able to figure it out. A healing miracle wasn't enough for the Lord. Jesus wanted more for them so that they'd experience through that raising of Lazarus the glory of God. Remember, that's what he said to his own disciples in that fourth verse. This sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God. And then he repeats it to... He repeats it to Martha. He said, Said I not unto thee that if thou wouldest believe, thou shouldest see the glory of God? That's what he wanted. In the end, they got much more than they bargained for. And I'm sure they weren't sorry for the surprising delay that was met with such a surprising result. When we try to work things out our own way, to make it happen, as we say, we'll always miss the, the overwhelming glory that God desires to show us of himself. And I wonder how many times we have missed it. I wonder how many times God had in mind to show us his overwhelming glory, but because we tried to engineer things like Abraham and Sarah and make it happen, we were impatient, we lost patience with God, we waited, we waited, nothing happened, so we took matters into our own, and we missed the overwhelming glory that God wanted to show us. To experience God's glory in your life, you have to learn to wait patiently on Him. And by the way, waiting on the Lord is not laziness. Waiting on the Lord is not passivity but it is a God-given ability to do nothing until God says now. Until God gives you the go-ahead. I want to close with a personal illustration. When I was a junior in college, I attended every night that I could after the evening meal a uh, meeting on campus called Mission Prayer Band. And what it was is students voluntarily could go to a particular uh, building and there would be uh, groups of students that were burdened for certain uh, missionaries or mission fields and, and we would pray for missionaries that were in those particular places. And uh, so anyway, God used that to develop a burden for missions in my heart when I was a college student. And when I was a junior, uh, an opportunity arose to go on a summer mission team, the whole summer, the whole summer from the be beginning of June to uh, the middle of August uh, to the country of Scotland. And I prayed and I felt the Lord wanted me to go. And uh, so we formed a team and uh, all of the team members, they they were told, you know, write to your, your pastor, your church, see if you can get some funds for your, your, your summer mission team effort, 
uh, from your, your, your home church, right? Your, your aunts and your uncles, you know, anyone, relatives or friends that you know would uh, take an interest that could contribute to it. Well, the Lord challenged me. I didn't tell anyone. But the Lord challenged me to not do that, but to pray and ask him, if he wanted me to go, Lord, you want me to go, I want you to supply my need. I want you to supply the money I'm going to need. Well, I happened to be the leader of the team, and all everyone had their money, and we were down to the last week. I didn't have anything. And I'm telling you, I felt foolish, and I was being really reamed out by uh, the one of the uh, the administrators on campus that was in charge. He was the, called the campus pastor. He was in charge of all of this, and he was he was very upset with me because I didn't have anything to show for it. And you're the leader of the team. What are you thinking? What are you doing? You know, and uh, I, I don't remember what I said. I don't remember what I said, but I didn't have anything. The last week, one of the girls on the team came to me and said, Jim, she said, you know, I got twice as much as I need, and I feel the Lord wants me to give it to you. She gave me, it was enough to buy my plane ticket, and uh, I had the money that, and I did it the last minute, I had the money I needed to, uh, to go on that team, and God taught me. But it was difficult to wait, especially when the pressure's on, even from people that you respect, people that you, know, you look up to, people that are your leaders, uh, and they're telling you, you're foolish, you, know? you need to do something. And God came through, and he vindicated, I guess, I guess he vindicated me, I don't know. But he provided for me, that's, that's the main thing. And I'm telling you, you got to learn to wait on the Lord. You got to learn to, de- that's what waiting on the Lord is depending on Him, okay? And, and let me just challenge you to not always work it out your own way, to stop trying to finagle and make it happen. Trust God so you don't miss that overwhelming experience of the glory of God in your life. Heavenly Father, I pray that we would learn from this that you are a God that brings surprising delays in our lives. But when it's all said and done, when it comes down to that line we experience surprising response from you. Unexpected, unexpected ways and results. And mostly, the blessing of seeing the glory of God right before our very eyes. Or teach us this lesson. Teach us the lesson that you had for these two sisters. May we live on that level. As the psalmist says, wait on the Lord. Trust also in him and he shall bring it to pass. Thank you for that confidence in Jesus' name.